faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find the body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of my companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost done. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the Gospel of Christ. Because when they run back to Jerusalem, they know exactly where to find the disciples. There are a number of theories, and any of us can go and research those theories as to the identity of those disciples. The one that makes the most sense to me personally is linked to John's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 25, where we read, 
There stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. The way in which the sentence is punctuated, certainly in the English, I can't speak for the Aramaic or the Hebrew or the Greek, it could mean that Mary of Clopas is Mary, mother of Jesus' sister, and therefore Jesus' aunt. Also, the Clopas part of her identification is not a town like we would have in the case of Mary Magdalene, who comes from Magdala, but seems to be a possible reference to her husband, Clopas, which is actually Cleopas and just the dropping away of the E. And that possibility is really shored up and seems to be supported by a number of credible theologians. Whichever version we like, whichever translation or theory we prefer, the main thing is these two people were well known to Jesus and Jesus was well known to them. Why didn't they recognize him? Was his resurrected body, his glorified body, so utterly other that even his own mother would have struggled to recognize him? We don't know. No answer is given to that question. There are any number of possible reasons. The extreme emotional distress they find themselves in, the tiredness, exhaustion, all of those are valid reasons for not recognizing Jesus. And I want us to own that. Because we who are living after three years of intense, abnormal life are in a similar situation ourselves. Please, can we be kind to ourselves when we also fail to recognize Jesus in our midst? Let's look at some of the reasons and some of the explanations because they are useful in our own spiritual journey when we struggle to hear to see Jesus in our midst. Perhaps the first thing that we need to note is that God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit seldom reveal themselves in grandiose, dramatic and overtly religious contexts. Most frequently, we encounter them in the intimate mundaneness of ordinary life. Just go back into the Gospels. Herding sheep, walking down a road, washing dishes, mowing the lawn, if the electricity allows us to mow the lawn. And the other thing to note and to take to heart is that the divine presence doesn't discriminate as to when is a so-called suitable time in which to reveal that self to us. No amount of ugliness in our lives, no amount of darkness can put Jesus off from being present to us. After all, I mean, surely part of our faith is that God is more than, that God is greater than any terribleness in our lives, in the context of our lives in the world. It really is in the midst of our struggles and joys, sorrows and delights, pain and health, despair and hope, in ordinariness that we constantly brush up against and encounter the sacred. And that's a relief to know. Often it's we who deny the possibility of God's presence being with us because we feel we're in a particularly mucky and ghastly situation and surely God wouldn't want to be associated with that. We can stop doing that. We can stop thinking that. And just let God be God, rather than telling God who and how God ought to be and when God is fit to be in our midst. Another contributing factor towards us not being able to recognize Jesus is related to what we are going through, and I've hinted at that already, and it's true for these disciples on the road as well. In verses 14 and 15, we read that these two people, 
And remember, this is the third day, so it would be what we would call Easter. But they've only lived through Good Friday and Holy Saturday. We hear they are processing stuff through talking and retelling and trying to come to terms with some of the horror, trying to make sense of all of the events that have happened in the last two days, including his, Jesus' crucifixion and, and also this story that the women are telling and that they're finding really hard to give any sort of credit to. Is it possible, and I know in our human experience it is possible, that these two disciples were so caught up in the details of the last couple of days and, and they've, they've gone into a spiral. You know how that happens. And when things are really at crisis or trauma, we go into a spiral where we just keep going over and over the same things and we become completely absorbed in the small details of what's happening there. And I'm not saying it's wrong or right. It's just a psychological reality. And what happens then is we lose focus on the bigger picture. It's such a reminder to us, isn't it? That when we reflect on the past, it is better to bring that into the present and to look at what we can learn and allow our attentiveness to expand and hold the past into the bigger reality rather than becoming absorbed and pulled back into the past only. Another aspect of our human lives which can cause us to be so blinkered and unaware of God's presence around us is when we hold on to unforgiveness. Now, unforgiveness makes us very myopic and can even cause a form of spiritual blindness. Just as an aside, I'd like to clarify that forgiving a person uh, or persons or an institution doesn't automatically mean that when we do forgive, that we are condoning or encouraging the perpetuation of hurtful, destructive or sinful behavior. That's not what I'm saying. What we do know is that by becoming attached to our unforgiveness, we dig ourselves deeper and deeper into a hole. And increasingly, that will limit our perspective on life and on God and on what God is already doing right there in front of us. And ironically, it's precisely at these sorts of times that we most need God's help. But that does presuppose a willingness to raise our eyes Godward to see matters, <clears throat> excuse me, within a greater reality and to surrender ourselves into God's vision. We're not told with these two disciples if there was some sort of unforgiveness. But if we extrapolate what was happening in their lives, it wouldn't have been unusual if they had found themselves in a place of, because it says there about them, they, they don't recognize, and then there's a sense in which there's a reason behind it. And I think maybe the unforgiveness was creeping into their lives because of the way in which the Jewish leadership had handled the whole thing and the Roman authorities and because of the sense of injustice being perpetuated on a very innocent man, giving him a criminal death. So it wouldn't be hard to imagine that they were starting to feel intense unforgiveness and justified anger towards the context and the situation. And then something else which we can all relate to, and I think as a nation, as a country, as a world, we're finding ourselves in this, and perhaps we're even recognizing it in one another and within ourselves, is the sense of being weighed down by despondency and hopelessness. Because when we are in that space, again, please say, 
allow yourself to validate that. It is a genuine sense of owning what we're experiencing given where we are. The problem is when we allow that to define our reality. Those two disciples in verse 21, we are told, said, we had hoped. And now those hopes are lying shattered in their hearts. And that's enough to make anyone feel despondent and depressed. Not only had things gone badly wrong for Jesus in their perception, but from the perspective of those disciples, their expectations of Jesus, their dream of who Jesus was going to manifest as had been destroyed. Because yes, they recognized he was the Messiah, but their paradigm and framework of what that was meant to be, possibly a strong military leader with a charismatic persona, crowd-stirring influence, rallying the Israelites together to overthrow the Roman oppressors. And maybe that paradigm was completely broken down and it lay at, at their feet, not knowing how to continue, paralyzing them and sending them into quite a dark place. It can blinker us then and shut us down to the light of Christ, which will always supersede any of that despondency. Now, those are just some of the things. They're not comprehensive. But I hope that we understand that our gospels speak into our common and shared humanity and honor where we are, but always invite us to look with a breath that stretches us beyond the boundary of where we're finding ourselves and to look into the horizons where God is both imminent and transcendent. In those difficult times, please let us encourage each other, encourage ourselves to be understanding, to look for the lesson, to be compassionate, to turn to God, even if we can't see where God is, to express to God our desire to be able to see and to acknowledge God's presence around us. And finally, and this is so important, to own for ourselves, to reassure, reassure ourselves with the truth that Jesus will never, never give up on us. Those seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, if we believe that it was seven miles, there are three possible towns that Emmaus will be identified with in today's archaeological understanding. Some traditions say it's more likely it was a town called Amwas, and Amwas is actually 20 miles from Jerusalem. And the reason some people say it's Amwas is because Emmaus means warm wells. And Amwas has two warm wells in it. Either way, the journey was long. And the disciples would have been walking slowly because of their despondency, because they were processing stuff. And Jesus took them right from Moses throughout all the prophets. Now that was not a five minute conversation. And it's a reminder, it's probably three or four hours. That reminds us again that God will persevere. When God needs to reveal whatever it is to us, God never gives up because we are taking so long to recognize God's work, God's word. God's presence in our midst, God will persevere and God will persist until we get whatever it is God is giving to us. We are more precious and more loved by God than we can ever comprehend and God will always find a way to be in touch with us. Let's hold on to that. Amen.